Here we go. Right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back to Fazlift's podcast, episode twelve. Um, very excited for this one. I've got a guest on, it'll be Alex Shinas from Team Metal Athletics, uh, who I'm super chuffed to have on. He's a great guy. I've known him for a few years now, and uh, in my eyes, he represents uh, really high-level competitive bodybuilding. He's had some amazing results with his clients. Uh, he's got a guy in the books right now who's like. In English money, he's like 22, 23 stone on the off-season with abs. He's turned out some absolute beasts. Um, and all his guys seem to come in absolutely peeled, and they make really, really good size gains in the off-season. And I know Alex himself, he was, uh, he was researching bodybuilding and, and competing in bodybuilding back when I first started researching and competing in powerlifting. So he's been at this for a long time. So uh, it's been awesome to get him on. So Alex, welcome to the show. And is there anything I missed off? No, no, I, that's pretty much who I am. I'm wondering, when did we meet, though? Like, uh, were you on GS15? Yeah, I was actually a moderator on there. You were? Yeah, I was on the pouting. Well, as much activity as it got, it was the pouting session, which is just a lot of fat guys talking about deadlifts. Yeah, right. So you transitioned into, into bodybuilding after. Yeah, pouting. yeah, I did my best. Yeah. Oh. All right, so then you've known me for like 10 years, then. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a core cool group of us who've known each other for, for about that long. Yeah, it's been a long time. I was, I was never on Get Big. Um, I, was always on right. the, I was always on the other shitty forums, but I never got onto that one. Yeah, well, I'm 41, so I started out on forums when I was 19 or 20. I think Chad Nichols had a forum. Mm -hmm. I think it was called Muscle Media 2000 or Muscle Mayhem 2000, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and at the time, it was Foad Abiyad. Uh, this guy Joe from Canada named Silverback, uh, Antoine Valen. It was a lot of Canadian guys were following Chad at the time. And uh, I was on there. Tom Prince was on there. Um, and then a lot of, you know, a lot of randoms and stuff who ended up on Get Big when that forum closed. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the GH15 phenomenon hit years later. <laughs> and I happened to be right in the middle of my comeback for competing. So I, I got swept up in that. And, it, it kind of propelled me back into the sport where I, I had fallen out for a while. So uh, that, and I met that, a lot of you guys. At that so, time, were uh, you, sorry, at that time, were you coaching or were you just falling out of competing yourself? So I, w I was coaching, but I wasn't getting paid to coach. I, what, what was happening was I was, I walked to, I got back in the gym. First, the, the first guy I trained with had no idea I ever lifted in my life because I was so out of shape. And I just grabbed him and said, hey, let's train. And he was like, okay, because we were both there in the middle of the day, um, kind of empty gym. And uh, he ended up, his girlfriend dumped him. And I said, I'll get you in the best shape of your life because they ended up booking a cruise that neither one of them would back out of. <laughs> and uh, so he said, I need to be so ripped that she hates me. I said, done. We got, we got that. <laughs> so, so six weeks later, he was, he was in absolute prime shape and made the best decision of his life to go on the cruise. Right. So, uh, yeah, but he went and, and he was ripped and that was the start of it. Somebody else saw him and said, how did you get this ripped? And he said, he got me in shape. And then, you know, I had to start pulling out my old photos to prove to people I, I knew what I was doing. Um, which is funny because, you know, it's like, you don't really need to look like anything to know what you're doing, but yeah people that don't have a lot of experience don't trust anyone who hasn't walked the walk. Yeah. So they just kind of want to see the proof. Um, so I had my old Polaroids and I'd pull them out. Um, and then, so my, my start really happened with a guy in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, he was training with these two old guys and he looked like he was a younger guy, maybe 24. Uh, and he had tremendous structure, tremendous shape. He was natural. Um, and these two old guys were, were doing these like, you know, Franco Colombo routines and they were stretching on the floor and, and doing T bars off the floor. And, and, uh, he was overtraining for what he was doing, but I saw him right away and I went over to him and I was like, all right, so you're going to compete. And he was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so long story short, in, in two years, um, we brought him from like 160 pounds to, to, uh, 240 pounds. And then we dieted him down to a light heavyweight and he won, his class at the New England's or the Cutler, wow. one or the other. Wow. Um, and he was on GH15. He was my first client on there named the Esquire. So a lot of people remember him. Mm -hmm. um, he had a fantastic structure and he ended up just kind of competing a couple of times and never really grabbing onto it, became a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that was my start. And, and from there, with a couple of guys that I had helped um, who didn't pay me, um, I created the portfolio. And on GH15, I started coaching. Um, and initially, it was because my, my son had been born and or he would been conceived and i said i need, i need to figure out how to monetize this because you know i need more money mm-hmm. and uh pretty quickly i was doing pretty well on that forum was very active um you know and i poured everything i had into it for mm-hmm. coaching i really worked hard for my clients and um even though i wasn't nearly as good as i am now as a coach i still got results so um that was my start yeah, the the very first I heard of you was through GH50, and you already had you were already a big name there. Um, so you you were a big name before Chester um, really came into his own as well. Yeah, so yeah. from what I remember. Yeah, I remember him coming along, and, and it was kind of when I was towards the end of my um, time there. Uh, there was there was a lot. Of, I was a moderator as well, and I kept trying to drop the moderator moderator position. As you know, I don't like being a moderator. <laughs> um, I don't like I don't like having people coming to me asking me to do things to other people yeah, <laughs> just yeah, doesn't yeah. vibe with me yes <laughs> so I, I was like no i'm not going to do that ask yeah. them. and by the way don't even ask these things you shouldn't do that yeah um so i i backed out of the moderator position and, and then ultimately i didn't want to pay for the forum space anymore in advertising and i i um as politely as possible declined and became a big war and I became public enemy number one because you did I yeah. really needed my $500 a month. Mm. So, um, but that was the end of it for me. I wasn't really on board with a lot of the way they were treating members and people. So I, I got out of there. Um, and Chester, you know, I think he was there for a bit longer and somehow yeah. he became the, the next public enemy and, mm-hmm. you know, but, uh, he and I became friendly and moved on to other places. Yeah. I think anyone who talked sense there became public enemy after a while. We've all, we've all been through ours. So yeah, the, the, the funny story with that for me was um, after I got banned for something inane, I forget what it was. Uh, my browser kept logging me on to the, um, to the forum. And so yeah. it must have been, I don't know, like a thousand, I think it was something like something ridiculous, like 350 times I had tried to log on. Yeah. Or like, it, obviously, I hadn't tried to log on, but every time I switched my browser on, you know, it kind of tried to log me in. And I actually got a message from GH15 saying, um, yeah, you know, you've proven that you're such a loyal uh, <laughs> GH15 follower because you've attempted to log in 350 times that, you know what, I'm just going to reinstate you. And I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. I didn't want to, I didn't want to break his bubble. I go, look, actually, dude, that was a complete mistake, but uh, <laughs> I just went with it. I might have even messaged you in just about that. I find it so funny. Um, yeah. That's funny. Right. So that was, that was sort of my first question. How did you get into bodybuilding and, and also your coaching? So I think that for those of you who don't know about GH15, because obviously being in the UK, um, a lot of these guys may not know that we had we had very much a Dorian influence around that time in 2000, 2005. It yeah. still, still very much infiltrates English bodybuilding. And I don't really think we came into our own until many years later, like with Jordan Peters and stuff like that. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully talk about that later on. But GH15 was a, was a large um, forum. It still is going, but uh, for my money, it's, it is definitely, it, it's gone down a lot in my, my estimation. So we'll get on to the second question. Um, this is more now to do with you as a coach and your opinion on things. So this is a question I'm really interested in because um, it's, it's kind of very relevant to me, <laughs> trying to be selfish. Training for the high-end bodybuilder. So what are the big priorities here? individual differences, your own, any of your own sort of personal training nuances, like how would you structure uh, training for a, for a top, for a high-end bodybuilder, for one of your big guys? Well, the bigger people get, the more susceptible to injury they are. Mm, yeah. um, not everybody, but some people are freaks and they, they, they just won't get hurt. Mm. But more or less, the, the bigger you get, the more impact you're putting on your joints, tendons, ligaments, and more careful you have to be. So typically what I do is I do a progressive overload for intermediate people. Um, in the beginning, it's, it's very meat and potatoes simple. There's no real plan necessarily. It's not a, it's not a program. It's just getting people to train correctly and, you know, do reps and sets and to failure and actually find what failure is. Um, I think that the vast majority of people training don't ever really find what failure is. They, they stop far short of it. Mm-hmm. Um, or is they that, train so heavy that 
Is that, a, is, that a, is that a requirement for you for a training to failure? Is that something you feel is necessary? At certain points. Um, in the inter, inter, intermediate stages where, like, let's say you've competed once or twice maybe, but you've still got 30 or 40, 50 pounds before you're a pro-level guy, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a period of time where you have to train extremely intensely and to failure with a progressive overload style to maximize your size gains. Um, and then when you've got a certain amount of muscle, the contractions are harder, everything is amplified, and it's no longer necessary. It might be optimal to continue training that way, but it's also the risk reward is the, the risk is much higher. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's a period, you know, for a lot of these people, by the time they get to that stage, they're monetizing their bodybuilding, whether it's a trainer or um, if they're high level bodybuilders, they're, you know, their job is to not get hurt and be sidelined. So um, Jay Cutler said it best. He said, it's his job to not get injured. Yeah. So you got to find a way to progress without ending your career or sidelining yourself for a season, which you're seeing a lot right now in the pro ranks. You see that a lot. Of lot of, yeah. We've seen that a lot in England as well, um, due to the what I feel is the sort of the, the high intensity approach. Um, just a side question on that before I let you carry on. I've not seen too many videos of your guys training, and I've always been interested in that. So, what does a typical set look like? How fast are they moving? Are they pausing, contracting? What, what, what are you thinking? Um, I'm going to disappoint you because there's nothing typical, hmm. but. I would say that the cadence would be fairly explosive, um, although not hyper explosive out of the hole. Like you're, you have to control your negative. Yeah. Um, I'm not doing a lot of tut stuff anymore. I do it basically to, to back off of volume and give people a rest. But um, the cadence would be pretty explosive in the in the in the uh, positive part of the rep um, lockout. I would go short of lockout by hair, um, squeeze really hard, and then control in the negative. It's a fairly – it's more about the biomechanics than it is the cadence. I think yeah. people can train at different speeds effectively. Yes. People have different, but I think that a lot of people do things biomechanically that put them at a disadvantage or they're actually trying to make the movement easier on their body, yes. um, whether they want to train heavier or uh, they just don't want to – you know the muscle to take the brunt of the movement so they're doing it with their joints yeah you know and their, and their bones their, their structure like i trained with a client yesterday and he's extremely strong uh way stronger than me probably twice as strong as me oh. and yet he was doing some inclined flies and he had his elbows way 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 high up near his ears and and his rep was about three quarters of the top part of the rep only mm -hmm. and i chastised him because you know i'm, I'm doing half the weight but you know, I'm hitting the full muscle belly and he's, he's saying, wow, well, you know, this works for me. It protects my shoulders. And I go, oh yeah, I get that. But you're kind of drifting away from, you know, muscular contraction here. Yeah. And so that's probably what I would look for the most is, are you fully getting a contraction? Are you stretching and contracting the muscle? Because I think a lot of people miss that. That, that makes a lot of sense. I typically with me and my guys, I will, especially for the guys who I work with who perhaps not as advanced as yours, uh, I'll typically start them off by slowing down, but I'll emphasize that the reason we're slowing down is to make sure you get yeah. the contraction right. If we get that, then great, you can speed up afterwards, but typically slowing it down allows them to think about what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, mm. I, I think slowing down makes everyone kind of do things better. Mm. Then there's a point where if you're going so slow, then you really are doing tut stuff, and I think there's a place for it. Mm -hmm. um, I trained for an entire season with tut, um, and actually what happened is after I stopped doing it, I became extremely strong and grew. So it hmm. kind of persuaded me to not do it full, fully all the time anymore. Yeah. Um, that I was growing without trying to grow after that it told me that I had been holding back something. Did you find so, that your, did you find that your own personal sort of history of injuries affected the way you coach people as well? Cause I, I certainly do. A thousand percent. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of the times there's like, uh, some of the people know uh, the guy named Chainsaw that I, Chris Nardi that I coach. He's probably the, the biggest guy that I've had. Um, and he's encountered this off season after last year when we, we had a great season. Um, he's encountered a bunch of injuries. He had a small pec tear, a small lat tricep pull that could have been a tear. Um, he's had some lower back stuff. 
uh, some hamstring stuff. And he's getting grass and work twice a week, three times a week. He's, you know, doing everything he can to stay healthy and stretching. Um, and it's still happening because, you know, he got up to 302 fairly lean pounds. And he's extremely strong. He can press, he could probably press if he tried. I'd say like the 585 range, somewhere in that range. That Holy pressing. shit. Is he's that chainsaw, by the way? Is, is that chainsaw? Uh, on, that? Is that chainsaw on Instagram? Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, just a chicken, monster. Uh, Holy he's shit. A, he's an enormous guy. He's an yeah. enormous guy. And he's extremely strong, too. So it's, you know, for him, I, I, I'm i training with him today, actually. We're, we're going to, with, with Chris Pantano, another one of my clients, who has an 850 squat. So these two fuck. guys are just absolute monsters. In them. And I'm back here going, all right, so let's do 600. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's. All right, how many can you get with 600, Chris? And he'll say, oh, I'd probably get 15. Let's do that. You yeah. know, because even there, you've got, you've got risk for injury. I mean, cool, people sure. are tearing. I tore my quad leg pressing, and I was on the 11th rep, and it tore. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, you can't even safeguard against that. If you're yeah. going to train, you're going to do 11 reps on something. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, then, I, you know, I partially tore uh, the pec uh, on just a, I think it was 265 on the bench for like the 15th rep. It was like a 20, 20 rep yeah. max weight for me. Um, and I thought, holy you shit, what, what's going on? Yeah. You got lucky because it could have been on a, on a much heavier load and you would have a bigger tear. Yeah. You know, that's what I did. I, I tore mine uh, doing 455 Fuck. and, and it fucking sucked. I didn't tear it off the, ton, the tendon, but it, it got me good. Mm. Um, and, that, and that was when I was 23 and I was actually a decent bodybuilder. Like mm. every time after that, I've, I've never been anywhere near as good after that happened. Yeah, I saw your pictures um, from when you were so, fantastic. I mean, I was just getting going, mm. you know. So it's just changed. Like I tell people all the time, like you, you have one of those and you won't be the same bodybuilder. You have two or three of those and you won't be bodybuilding. Yeah. You know, yeah. I have another one. I'm going golf and I'm done. <laughs> so just, just to straight back training to. Training has to be. So, so you have to find ways to have intensity. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's your mindset. You have to be willing to put yourself in a painful spot for a set. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be ultra heavy, but you have to be able to strap yourself to that bench and get, get those reps that are, it's not that you people are failing, but they're failing with poor mechanics. So it's not, it doesn't really hurt the muscle, right? It doesn't really burn, mm -hmm. but if you're doing it with good mechanics, you're getting an incredible burn. Yeah. And most people want to stop far forward short of failure if they train that way. To circle it back to chainsaw, what, because this applies to a lot of guys um, my local guys at the moment, the ones I don't coach, a lot of them are getting injured from various reasons. What's your plan now moving forward for Chainsaw? But he's had some injuries. What are we going to look at as, uh, to, to safeguard against that? So, well, he had, a, he had an injury last week. He had the, the lat and tricep pull last week. Um, and we're, we were 17 weeks out of North Americans. Um, there was no altering the course so far. Um, we, we took a look at it and... Um, no structural damage. No, looks like if there was a tear, it's extremely minor. Um, but his training, basically, we've gone to two days, and I've lightened the load on him, so he has to do more giant sets, kind of like Milo's training. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really like Milo's training. It's it's got far too many giant sets with like five or six movements or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I look at it and I don't even think it's weight training. Yeah. Um, it's like aerobics. Yeah. Um, I agree. But I'll do I'll do three or four supersets back to back for him. And so it makes it so that no matter what he's doing, it's he's using 80% of his ability, uh, his max weight. So he's lessening the injury risk. And then we're just taking it easy around the areas that are tender for now. Um, he's so developed now that it's, it's not really a risk of, of him getting underdeveloped or not coming in big enough. It's not going to be the problem. So it's, it's mostly going to be conditioning him and having him, um, eat enough to be big um, yeah. it's a big thing for big guys before i got him he was doing keto diets and coming into shows and getting third fourth and fifth in it and i you know i i was like this guy if he ever diets right he's gonna beat everybody and so he ended up hiring me because somebody somebody that i i coached beat him and told him they were friends and said you should go hire alex right. and so i he hired me and, and we had a great off season and you know we started the prep at 1100 carbs last year so he was eating 1100 and we got down to his low days were at 300. So the lowest day he had in the entire prep was 300 carbs. Wow. Um, and he came in absolutely 
peeled. So, yeah. I mean, we could probably improve a little bit on condition, but he came in so much further peeled than he had ever been. Um, you know, and that's kind of a key that I don't think people realize is you've, you've got to eat yeah. and be able to maintain that food and not get fat. You've yeah. got to have an activity level. There's something to the thermogenesis of movement and burning through food that 100%. makes people bigger and leaner. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what it is. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's like a scientific thing that I understand, but everybody who trains more, stays healthy, eats more, comes in bigger, comes in sharper. Mm-hmm. If you do less and you eat less and you know, you're trying to get in by doing lots of cardio, you're just not going to be the same, especially a big guy. Yeah. I, so. I, I think for, for just to kind of frame this a little bit, I really do recommend some of my guys who are listening to this, my aspiring bodybuilder guys, go and take a look at your page and just look at how big he is. Um, because I, I've actually it tried to get, it's ridiculous because I've actually tried to get a couple of my local guys to contact you and get you to coach them. Cause I know what you do with these guys. So for those of you it, listening, it, you I, know, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of about two or three from my hometown who yeah. you can work wonders with. Well, I, I guess if you were to ask others, you'd pr- what you'd probably hear about me is, oh, he makes really big monsters. He makes big guys. Yeah, right? which is I what mean, I say so about you. The dig, on, the dig on me for a very long time is that I don't get them as peeled as I should. Mm. And I sort of agree. I sort of disagree. Um, I've had a lot of people who have come in extremely peeled. And then I've had people that have come in, the same people who have come in not as good the second time or uh, – I've had a couple of people I haven't been able to nail and uh, you know, it's, and they say, Oh, you can't get them peeled. And I'm saying, well, you know what? I show everybody, everybody I have. You're seeing, when you see Matt Jansen's page, you're, you're only seeing the best people he has. Mm, yeah. When you see Andrew Vu's page, you're seeing the best people he has. I know 15 of Vu's clients who look like dog shit. Mm-hmm. I know them. Um, and he's not going to show you those people. Everybody knows all of my clients. I show them everybody, you know, they see them. It's not easy to get everybody in shape. Sometimes it looks like a weight loss challenge, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, well, I saw what so, you did with um, Ollie recently. Uh, I thought that was amazing because I think he was about three or four weeks out and I actually got a message from somebody on the forum saying that Ollie looks, doesn't look ready. Um, but yeah. you, managed to, you managed to get him in within the last, the last sort of three or four, three weeks or two weeks, there's a huge amount of change and you, he, just, he just got absolutely peeled. Absolutely peeled. Yeah, I thought I thought Ollie actually was his best two weeks out. Yeah, um, and he, you know we had some personal hurdles and and it, it it didn't come together quite as sharp as it could have in the end. And actually, right at the very end, it kind of fell apart. It, like a lot of times when you have a lot of stress, the the peak stuff doesn't work on you. Yeah, um, it, you just soften out, and your body says cortisol, fuck this. You know? But that's nothing that you were doing with him. That was his life stresses. Honestly, I, I I probably could have brought Ollie in a little leaner earlier, but I, we were we were dieting really hard and he was going at it hard. Ollie doesn't feel pain, you know. <laughs> like we were we were pushing him pretty hard. He's he, I think he just needs muscle maturity. So the areas that on his body that um, that weren't quite as as hard um, just need to be denser. That's all it really is. He needs a little bit more glutes and hamstrings density. Um, he's got tremendous size quads, but they're not not dense yet he's a young guy you know yeah aesthetically he aesthetically he's crazy mm-hmm. um but you have to look at where he was two years ago three years ago he was a men's physique guy with with bigger legs than normal yeah um and he's become a bodybuilder so yeah you know not everybody becomes a national level bodybuilder in two years it just doesn't work like that you know some people no, I mean, like, it's, it's a tremendous achievement what you've done with him it's amazing well I, I mean you give you give all five years no matter who's coaching him he keeps it up mm. you give him five years he's still going to be what 30 35, 32, something like that, mm. that right? Um, bodybuilding doesn't even start until you're 32. Like, yeah. you're not even really, really good until you're in your 30s. Mm-hmm. Um, like, really coming into your prime, you know? So, his, his, his estrogen levels will change. He'll, they'll drop as he gets older. His, everything will get better. So, you, you see him in five years, if he continues to progress, he'll be a heavyweight contender if he's not already pro. Um, and that's, you know, and I don't think it really matters if he if he does it on his own or with me or anybody else, I think he's going to get there. Mm. Will I get him there faster? Maybe. I, but that's, that's my opinion. Yeah. I mean, from, from what I've, uh, I've, I've spoken to him, I don't think he has any intention of changing coaches. So I think, uh, I think he's good. But um, so let, if we were trying to round out the discussion by moving on to the next topic and so we've talked about sort of training for the high end bodybuilder. Let's talk about diet. We've kind of touched on that a little bit. So speaking more in terms of off season 
gaining maintenance phases. Uh, I know you don't really do things in terms of hard and fast phases. You kind of, as any good coach would do, you keep an eye on things and adjust when necessary. But can you give me some examples of where you've done that in the off-season? The uh, specific question again, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, Kish, can you give me some examples of how you've adapted and changed diets for the bodybuilder in the off-season? Um, I know, for example, you don't do uh, strict phases. You just keep an eye on people and adjust as necessary. So, can you just talk me through some of the adjustments you okay, need in the yeah, off-season? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what I try to do is not recomp as long as possible. Um, so, the, what that means is I don't believe in overeating until you need to recomp and then recomping until you can then overeat again. Um, I think that people could be a little fatter than they are getting before they recap, recomp as long as they don't have a show imminent. And I think that probably from show day to show day, 18 months is probably perfect. I think yeah. people trying to get back on stage within a year, unless they're going to get back on stage in like four months, um, which you can do and get, you can get better doing that. I've done it. Um, unless you're going to do that, I, I really recommend cleaning out, taking time off, um, you know, maybe not necessarily just for balance in your life. It's not really just that, but it's um, to be your healthiest. Optimally, you kind of have to back off, you know, yeah. and sometimes that means you have to back off the intensity in your mind about bodybuilding. You have to get other, other interests and, and, and refresh. Um, and then you can grow, you can really push. And so for that to happen, sometimes you need 10 weeks or so after a show. Um, you know, more or less. Some people six, some people 10, some people 14. Um, for me, after shows, I usually stay really tight. And then I have like three or four months where I just, I'm not even thinking about body, <laughs> thinking about business and other things. Yeah. Um, and I fall apart in those areas, but that's because I'm not a serious competitor. I'm not somebody with goals or aspirations as a competitor. I've, I haven't been for some time. I've always competed just because I feel like I can and I want to get back in shape and I want to show people that they can do it. Uh, I am competitive. I do want to win, but I don't have the structure to do it or the, the, the desire to do it to, to get to a certain point. I'm not trying to win anything specifically. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that people need to, they need to eat more for longer and be able to get their bodies. So they need to be more active. That's one of the things um, in order to stay leaner um, and then push the weights and push your, push your PO phases um, that, so that you can extend them and then carry the weight for longer. Uh, if, if you can sit at a, at a new body weight for a couple months, you know, five or 10 pounds heavier than your previous, and you can sit at it, you can really kind of pound in that density. Um, if you're always yo-yo dieting back and forth, you're never really going to do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm doing is I'm just making sure people don't get too fat. And I'd rather just kind of curtail the calories and increase the activity and not call it dieting. I'm not recomping. Yeah. Even though that's what's happening, um, you know, they're still cleaning up the lines, but they're still able to train really hard. Um, and then if people hit a wall, I really just give them almost full rest. So people start developing tendonitis and, um, you know, fatigue and difficulty sleeping, difficulty eating. We pretty much just back off completely at that point and give them, give them a rest rather than going into diet phases. Um, you know, we kind of rest, and pull the calories back. They'll tighten up just from that. Um, and then we go back to it once they're, once they're ready. I've got one guy right now, Pat, who's made a tremendous, um, gains in the off season, but he's just ran into elbow and knee problems. And, and I, I, for the last two months, I've had him basically not training and every single Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, he sends me a new check-in saying, am I ready yet? <laughs> I, I want to train. And I'm like, I know, how's the elbow feel? He's like, it's fully trash. <laughs> all right, well, you're not training. Well, we're not training because it's tennis elbow. You're not gonna. It's not gonna get better. Until you yeah, know, exactly, you know, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. just not gonna get better. No. So, you know, as soon as it turns the corner, we'll we'll go back at it. You know, he's down like I don't know nine pounds or something. He's like, I feel like I've lost it all. We haven't lost it all. <laughs> it's, it's right there. Yeah. It's coming right back. Trust me. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more, like you said, monitoring people. Yeah, yeah, which I think is the I, – I generally think that's the best way to go. And I, I also favor very long off-seasons for my guys. Uh, if I can persuade someone to just be in an off-season for a good sort of 12 months, um, just yeah. raising calories, occasionally pulling them back if we need to, then that's really the way I've made the best. You've got to think about um, who you're working with, too. Like, 
there was a time that I used a lot more gear with people than I do now. And I really had to pull them back and give them more time and worry about their health more. Um, even so, even with what we're doing now, um, which just to give you like an idea, I've always been a test based guy. I've always enjoyed tests more than I do my Mandrillons. Um, sometimes Primo, if it's good Primo, I'll, I'll throw in people's stacks, but I like testing mast quite a bit. And I don't do any orals in the off season. I, I might throw them in just for if people want to go to the beach or whatever, they want to get lean, they want to, you know, have a summer. I might throw them in for them if they ask, but if it's part of my program for them to grow as a competitor, I don't even use orals. Um, I'll use test suspension for pre-workouts. Um, but basically like it, you could expect that I would recommend somewhere in the range of 600 to 1200 milligrams of test, depending on what your goals are. And, um, for a really, truly huge guy, the most I've ever done is, is two grams of test, which is a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's unnecessary. I think, um, I, so, you know, pe people like they hit up chainsaw and they say, like, oh, how much, how much were you on for your, for your, for your cycle for, you know, for your shows last year? And he was like, well, I was on a gram of test, and, you know, 400 milligrams of mast. And I did, uh, I did 50 milligrams of trend every other day. And they started laughing. <laughs> they were like 50 milligrams. So they were like, well, yeah, we started at 100, but we didn't like the fluid retention. So we pulled it to 75, but then to 50. And ultimately, we pulled it three weeks out completely. Yeah. And they're like, you're fucking lying. You know, well, what, what about GH? This is like 10 IU Atlantis and a couple, you know, Humilaga at, at refeeds and three IU of GH. Hmm. They're like, that's less than I'm using. Like, yeah, well, I'm a better bodybuilder than you. It's yeah. fucking, you know, that's all it is. So I, I, you know, I've I, learned that. I, I like, hear I, that. You can't bomb somebody. You know, you can't bomb somebody that doesn't have it and make them have it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I hear that so much from the old guys at my gym as well. Um, they, they all used to train with Dorian, Dorian Yates back in sort of like the 90s. And yeah. most of them, while, while they did admit to some fairly high dosages, most of them really say that the food is the limiting factor. Uh, and that's pretty much what I hear from a lot of pro bodybuilders, that food is always going to be a limiting factor. It's not going to be the drugs. Um, it's, it's going to be the food. Because you know what? The food is what that requires effort. Consistently it, it's up. interesting because um, I know Nasser ran incredibly high doses, um, like always. And then I know Kai Green, I should say, I, I know from a secondhand source that Kai Green's been on like three to four grams of tests forever. Holy fuck. Like, like fucking forever. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, then I remember being in a room with Jay Cutler and some other guy asking him about drugs. And he asked Jay, uh, I'm on a gram of tests, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Jay just stopped and goes, why so little? <laughs> you know? And I, don't, I, I, to this day, don't know if he was joking or not not but he had straight face so i i just expected that he was like why are you on so little you know what you since know? since we're on the topic let's just throw it out there what, what are some of the craziest doses you've heard of from actual pros not from your average that I've show on the street but from pros all right so most people know that i believe that gh15 was nasser yeah. uh the reason i believe it is because when we started uh when i say we started i, I was one of the five people who started gh15 we were in a chat room and so I would log in and we'd have a chat room and talk about how we want to build the forum. It was, I could tell you exactly who was in that room and GH15 is one of them. And whenever we were alone, I would joke with him and call him Nasser and he'd laugh. And, and then I gave him my email and then all of a sudden I was getting emails from forwarded to me that were to Wong Hong, who he was training at the time with protocol. So it was from Nasser's email. Yeah. So, Either this guy hacked Nasser's email or knew Nasser or he was Nasser. It was one or the other. Yeah. And I just, I just tend to believe it was him at some point and he had multiple people on the account because he liked to fuck around. And um, the protocols that I saw he was giving Wong Hong were out of control. And so if he was giving Wong Hong these protocols, then I can't even imagine what he was doing. But yeah. you're talking about like, like two grams of trend a week. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of Masteron, I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was like 800 to 1,000 milligrams of Masteron. Uh, the test was, he liked to pull the test down low at the end, but he, he had the test up at two grams earlier on. Um, he had Anadrol in there. He had, uh, I think he had Superdrol in there at one point at, towards the end. And then there was like a diuretic cocktail for the show. I mean, it was, it was like three or four diuretics. Um, and so I looked at it and I was, and Wong Hong was replying like, 
basically like, uh, I don't know what, how I'm going to find these things. <laughs> NASA was like, fucking do it. And he got all pissed off at him. And, and then Wong Hong did it and then did really well. He actually placed really well. It was like his best showing. And then he just stopped competing because he was probably like, I feel sick, you know? Yeah. Um, but that was, that was some of the crazy eye-opening stuff. I, when I lived in New York, nobody really talked to me about it. It wasn't really like nobody would specifically say what they were doing. Um, but you know, there were, there were guys that it was just kind of whispered that like, like Max Charles is a great guy, super nice guy, but it was just kind of whispered that he was just taking bottles of shit. Hmm. Um, you know, yeah. I don't know anything about one rail, but those guys, you know, I think people have this sort of romantic notion that a lot of the old pros just didn't use as much gear. Um, but if you've ever seen any interviews with these guys and just you've realized that the passion and the dedication they have towards their goal, uh, you, you yeah. have to question why wouldn't they? I think everyone's different. I really do. I think that, like, I think Lee Priest probably, he's lying about what he did, right? But I think he's probably closer to the truth than he is closer to lying. Like, I don't think he did anything near what other guys were doing and he was just a freak. Um, I think it's clear that he's a freak. You can look at him and know he's a freak. Yeah, of course. And so I think he's the kind of person that could literally take Primo Bowen and Winstrel only because he was lazy and couldn't find tests or couldn't afford it. Mm. And, you know, just like an Anavar fell on the floor from Paul Dillette and he was like, oh, I'll eat that too. Yeah. You know, and that's like what Lee Priest did. And then, you know, I don't think he gave a fuck. It was like, that was what he did. And if somebody asked him, he'd be like, ah, I just use a little Primo and Winstrel. Well, how much? <laughs> I don't know. Like, I wasn't, you know, I don't yeah. know what day I took him. Like yeah. he probably took a few shots a week and just didn't really think about it. But that's some of those guys. I knew a guy, he was a, I think he was a Samoan guy. I don't know what he was, but he had a giant mullet and a Corvette. <laughs> <It was like, laughs> and he pulled up to the gym and he came in and he just starts like incline pressing four plates. And he had like a chest as wide as the Corvette. And, uh, with jean shorts on no legs whatsoever and he comes in and there was this other guy there that, that people might know him if, they're, if they ever listen that they're near us so i'll say his name ken gleason his name was jack man he was 330 pounds giant dude traps out of his head just out of the top of his head and so he went over to ken i was right there in front of him i was i was a college kid and he says hey ken can i get some drugs and ken was like what do you want he's like i don't know pills i don't want to take a shot I'm like okay well give him some d-ball this dude came back every other day, five pounds heavier, every other day for like a month. He like the end of the month, he comes in and we're like, what, what the hell? He went from like 240 to like 300 yeah. and on D ball. Right. Oh, and, and he's just, and he's just bench pressing like five plates, just jangling the plates around and never does legs. And then he would be like, all right, off to my dad's roast beef shop, to eat roast beef. And that's what he did. And so just watching that was like, no matter how many drugs I took, I would never be as big as him, no yeah. matter what. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, you know, it's just kind of, if you don't pay attention to that and you don't, it doesn't prove it to you, then you're not paying attention. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think you're going to know fairly quickly, uh, either natural or uh, enhanced, you know, if you've kind of got it to be a pro. <clears throat> you don't know how much you've got it or how yeah. little you've got it. Like, you can get pretty good, right? But you really do know the ones who, who got it, got it. Yeah. You know, and you know you're not one of them. So, you, it's a tough thing because it's like I say the vast majority of everybody doesn't really have it. And I had this conversation with Chainsaw the other day, actually, this is what I told him. So he's 32 this year. I said, if you're, I told him this last year and then we had a conversation the other day. I said, you've got, you've got two years to turn pro and you've got four years to get on the Olympia stage or you're fucking done. And he was like, yeah, well, people are, you know, people go into the forties. I go, yeah, but you're not gonna I'm like, I care about you. I care about your family. I care about your health. Yeah. You're going to die if you're doing this in your 40s at 300 and something pounds. Yeah. Um, it's not worth it if you're not good, right? If you're not on the Olympia stage, then you're going to get down to 240 pounds and go back to golfing. He was like a state champion golfer. Like, wow. go back to golfing. That's what you're going to do. And he was like, you know what? You're right. And so we started talking about it. And I was like, if, if you had to talk to the current pros, what would you tell them? Like, he asked me, what would you tell them, you know, to do with their careers? And I'm like... I would tell almost everybody to quit, right? So because, like, I would tell everybody to push as hard as they can to see what the pinnacle of what they are is. And then when they hit that pinnacle and they can't go further or it's, the again, the risk-reward is terrible, to quit. 
So like if a team Williams came to me and was like, what should I do? I'd be like, you're done, buddy. You're an awesome bodybuilder. You're fucking tremendous. Like, what are you going to win? You know, the New York pro or like, you're not going to win the Arnold, you know, you're only going to win the Arnold if everyone sucks. Um, you're never going to win the Olympia. You're never going to make enough money at bodybuilding to make it worth it. You're spending everything you have. And so for what, like, just cause you love lifting. So the lift, who cares? Lift. Right. Like, so oh, there's a lot of guys like that, you know, he's like, well, what about Luke Sando? And I'm like, Luke Sando has been terrible seven times out of eight. He's been one time he was tremendous and people are like, he could be Mr. Olympia. And I'm like, sure, I guess if he hit it perfectly one time and everyone else didn't, but like, should Luke Sando quit? No, of course not. But when should he quit? Right? Like in a couple of years, if he hasn't done it, should he quit then? Should John De La Rosa quit? Should, you know what I mean? So I'm yeah, talking yeah, about people yeah, who are yeah. incredibly better bodybuilders than I've ever been. And, you know, I'm going to get shit for this. People are going to say, well, who are you to tell them to quit? Well, I don't know. I'm a guy who who would give them good advice and tell them yeah. that they should preserve their health and don't, you know, don't try to win a trophy. You're not going to win. Yeah. You know, so, you know so. I think, I think that's a positive message. And I think I just kind of want to round that section out by just uh, saying to, cause there's going to be a lot of guys listen to this who are taking uh, stuff, you know, a lot of the guys who follow me, uh, whether they admit to it or not. And I think it's worth being realistic. Um, but I think it was maybe Dorian, Dorian Yates said that if he didn't win the night champions, that he would have just quit bodybuilding at that point. Cause he just, like you're saying he was good, but he never really would have made a career out of it. But the fact that he did right. and he went on to be Mr. Olympia, he thought, okay, great. Okay. I, I can carry this on. But otherwise, even at that level where he was competing in America, he, he thought, if I'm not actually winning anything particularly significant, why am I putting my body through this? Well, Dorian's an absolute, absolute anomaly. anomaly. He's just not the same as anyone. As you can see now by looking at him in his life, he, he does what he thinks is best for his life. And, you know, we could all learn from that for sure, but he's not typical in any way. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think it's difficult because everyone wants to compare to Dorian and there's just no comparison, right? Um, but if you're talking about the landscape of pro bodybuilders now, um, and they're like, the Olympia is up for grabs this year, but the real question is, is there a perennial Olympia winner in the wings? Like who's left? Because everybody that's up for grabs is like 40 years old. Yeah. So yeah. if you're in that group of people that can get to the next level and possibly win the Olympia, you should be doing everything you can right now. And I do mean everything. Like you should be focusing on winning that show. Like Jay Cutler believed he could win that show when he was 21 years old, when no one thought it was like, you'd, you'd laugh at him. Yeah. And he thought, he thought he was going to win that show. And, and he did everything he could to win it. And then he won it. Right. It took a long time, but he did it. Yeah. So like, if you're not putting in that type of effort, then like, why are you taking drugs? I think, you know, to, to circle it back to putting in that amount of effort as well, just to kind of emphasize like what we're talking about here, we're talking about guys who not only have been on the pro stage, so they're enormous, so genetically they're amazing, but also they've been living bodybuilding for years. So if you're a guy just getting into this and you're thinking, okay, I want to start on a small test cycle or something like that, maybe just reevaluate what the fuck you're doing, first of all, before you start delving into that whole side of things. And this is, yeah, I've, I mean, I think, I've had I think this conversation with many people. Yeah, I think there's a period of time when you're young where you've got a, you've got enough wiggle room with your health that you're like you're not going to get sick or, unless you're doing something really stupid or you're predisposed. You, you've got enough time there where you can kind of figure out what you are, and technically you can abuse drugs a little bit, right? And yeah. figure out what you've got for a response. And but what the difference is, you've got to take control of your health. You've got to watch your blood pressure. You've got to take your blood work, um, learn to read it because your GP is not going to um, seek out counsel for how to read your blood work, what to really look at, you know, it's, it's your body. So you should take early on, just take, take responsibility for it. And if you do that and you're honest with yourself about your progress and your effort and all of that, I think you'll make the right choice. Yeah. I think that's what it comes down to. And I've got a lot of people who do that. They'll, they'll push for a couple of years and then they say, you know what, I'm going to enter dental school and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to become a doctor and, I don't think it's worth it. I'm just going to do TRT for a while and then maybe I'll try to come off of that. Maybe I'll stay on it. I don't know, but they're, they're done blasting. Um, and I think that's typically a very wise choice. And there's a lot of people you see that just 
just keep taking shit and never go to the doctor and never take a look. Don't know what their blood pressure is. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's the danger zone. I think that's well, you, look, really you, it, you know? look, you and I have seen it ourselves. I mean, it's not just the blood work either. It's just general health after a while. I mean, we've known guys who have had heart attacks, you know, on the forums and stuff. Right. Um, and they're, they're, they're saying their blood work is fine. So it, it, you, you've got to be cognizant of everything and just look at how, how it's all affecting you. And if it's not worth it to you, and for a lot of people, it probably isn't. Um, it's, it's worth thinking about whether you really want to do it or not. Well, I think, I think it's like the worth it thing, right? So what it comes down to, in, in my opinion, is you, you, gotta, you can't underestimate yourself when, at the outset. So it's like a lot of people have this tendency. I have clients that will talk negatively about themselves. Um, oh, you know, like I don't like the way this looks. I don't like the way this looks. This other person has it better than me. Yeah. Um, always pointing or sending pictures of someone else. Uh, this is what I want to look like, that thing, right? that whole that whole idea and i think you need to extinguish that mentality entirely from your life and just and give yourself some credit and then start working and then be objective about the result of your work mm-hmm. and i think that once you start doing that you're going to have results that exceed what that previous person's expectations were mm-hmm. um, and i'm not saying to be arrogant or cocky i'm saying to be um to believe in yourself really mm-hmm. you know if you're going to be a pro athlete or if you're going to be in business or anything else, you're going to come, you're going to go through extremely deep valleys of tough times to get there. And if you don't have a fundamental belief that you're doing it for the right reason, that you want to be doing it, that you should be doing it and that you can come out the other end and you will, then you just, you're just not, you should not be doing that, whatever that endeavor is. You shouldn't start that business or uh, push for that, you know, that trophy or whatever it is. Uh, So right from the out, you have to have, a positive uh, self view, you know, otherwise it's, it's, you're going to end up in a bad spot. And so I, I see it a lot and, and there's, it, it's hard to coach too. It's, you know, to yeah, have to, to have to talk to people and tell them that they're worth something more than they think they are is a tough thing to tell people all yeah. the time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so you, you gotta, you gotta start giving yourself credit for, for, you know, what you're, what you're able to do, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So we went off on a on a bit of a tangent there, which was a really good tangent actually. I, I like I enjoyed that. So let's sort of carry on with the the drug talk. <laughs> um, okay. In terms of the off season, we've already kind of identified um, test being your anchor. You use Mastron as well. Um, how how long are we sort of? What's the length? Of, so we said eighteen months. Are we are we kind of like blasting the whole time? Are we rotating dosages? What how, how does that use? I typically start reining people in about 20 weeks out. Um, you know, and it's, it, initially it's just kind of cleaning up the edges with cheat meals. Um, I don't change anything with drugs. Uh, or I might, I might have had them reduced. I might, you know, bump up test or the things that need to titrate up, I will continue to titrate up. But the other stuff I'll keep the same. Uh, I try not to, I don't use, I think you're going to ask me about fat burners and stuff like that, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I don't think that everybody needs to use T3. I think it's a crutch for a lot of people. And I, I see a lot of physiques that I can immediately identify as overusing T3 because they look very flat, two dimensional. Yeah. Um, I think you can optimally get your thyroid working with T4 in a lot of situations if you're on GH and, you know, T3 in the, in the lower dose range, if necessary, is, is where I go. Um, as far as approaching prep, I really don't look at, like, if I go through my logs for people that I've had done four or five shows, every prep looks completely different. I didn't have like, okay, it's 12 weeks out. Let's put this in. It just doesn't go that way. There's some preps that like I did a prep with, uh, Austin Ragland, the first one, he was, he was decent. We, we had a short prep. He only had like eight weeks and I didn't know much about his body, but he had trend in there and some other stuff. And, and uh, it came in kind of wet looking. And so we took a whole off season and we decided after tinkering with trend that it just wasn't a good drug for him. So we did the whole prep without it entirely. Um, and he came in very dry and much better. Um, and then, so going into the next off season, we decided to play with trend a little bit to see what would happen. And he was actually better suited to it at a later date. Like he was leaner, his body was drier and it handled trend better. So 
at that point in time, two years ago, it wasn't a good drug for him. But later on in, in, in his progression, it became a good drug. And I think the mistake would be if you don't have that data to look back at and really figure out what had happened is you go, Austin doesn't respond to trend and we don't use it, mm -hmm. right? So you just never use it again. And I think that's a mistake. I think that your body changes and there's things that'll work that don't work later and you need to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't use a lot of clen. I don't use a lot of fat burners. I'll, I'll tinker around with like injectable L-carnitine, um, Yohimbine. Um, I'll use clen in pulses. I think that it fatigues people, mm. um, especially if you're doing a lot of cardio, a lot of stims, too much caffeine. There's a lot of cortisol response and I don't, I don't like to overly stress that. So I have people focus on their activity levels and steps more than I do their, their amount of cardio per day. Um, and we, we pulse everything. It's like, you know, I'll talk to people every other day, basically, sometimes every day it gets close and, you know, it's like really starts out with how do you feel today? Yeah. You know, I feel great. Awesome. Let's push it today. You know, let's, let's, let's bump up the activity. Let's get the steps up to 20,000 today, yeah. you know, and Hey, we were only doing uh, 40 MCG of Clem. Let's do 80 for a couple of days and then we'll take it out again. Hmm. I don't think that's a night. I don't think that's a common approach. I think that most people just keep titrating it. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I just don't do that. I I'll pull it out and, and then put it back in. And I think that's, it's mostly just a response to how they're, how they're doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I get people, like I had a guy yesterday who was like, I haven't gotten out of bed today. You know, we, I had him on no carbs for three days, um, which isn't typical for me, but he's had a very stubborn period with his fat loss. So I, I went really low, kept, you know, did a little bit of, of keto, basically dieting and uh, had, had his activity really high. And then the third or fourth day, he was just like, I'm in bed. I'm not getting out of bed. <laughs> and I was like, all right, so tomorrow we're going to do a carb refeed. It's not going to be a big one. You know, so like every, like he might carb refeed on 200 grams and then someone else might do it on a thousand, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's just no cookie cutter answer for, for these things. And I think like, if you look at Austin Stout's preps, mm -hmm. um, I love I love to look at Austin Stout's preps because they're so structured. They're so rigid. Right. Mm. And, but he's so in tune with what's happening day to day. Like you, you see his analysis of it. That's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to analyze it like that. I'm trying to get the data to be, um, to be able to analyze something and see what's happening. So yeah. that's, that's how I structure what I'm doing. I think, um, I think also to kind of round that off, the, the theme that's kind of coming through with a lot of what you do, regardless of whether it's sort of diet or drugs or whatever, it, there's, a, there's a level of objectivity there. So you're observing, yeah. you're evaluating, and then objectively you're, you're kind of picking a route based on that rather than saying, okay, this is what the structure is going to be. Let's just follow this. Right. Yeah. And, the, and earlier on in, in my coaching days, I wouldn't have the confidence to do that. Um, I would, you know, stick to the plan, stick to the plan and see it out. Um, I would map things out in advance, like pretty thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, and I know this drives people crazy now that I'm working with. So I tend to try to give them an outline and then I burn the outline, but I, I do give them one. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And then they'll be like, okay, well, this is, this is where you said we're going to do that. And I'll be like, we're not doing that. You know, we might do it, but you know, I'll, I'll feel more confident in making changes or, or abandoning some sort of a plan. Um, just based on, like you said, objectivity and just seeing what's happening. Um, I think that's the best way. I mean, I'm, I very much like that with my own clients as well. It's, it's that I don't think there is any kind of cookie cutter plan. I've not actually seen any of Austin Stout's preps, but um, I think it's a case of for me certainly. I want to, I want to just uh, respond rather than anticipate. So if I was going to tell tell people like like a one sentence answer, start earlier in your prep and go slower. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the main thing. Most people, they pull food too fast. They do too many stims. They do too much too fast. And then they, they try to do it all at once. And so, so, you know, they think like, oh, we should, back when, back, back when I was coming up, all the pros said they, said they did 12-week preps. So I would start my diet 12 weeks out, and I'd, I'd get to like three weeks out and be like, how the fuck did they get this done? In 12 weeks? <laughs> yeah. You know? And I, I abandoned my plans for, for the stage like multiple times because of it. So I started doing 16 weeks. And then I realized like people started saying 16 weeks was like kind of the norm. And then 
And then, so I started doing 20 weeks <laughs> and, and when I started doing 20 weeks with a lot of people, it wasn't that I started dieting them hard. It was just that they got in the mindset early and then we, we were able to have the flexibility to, to abandon ideas um, because we had time and to really actually look at the data and not, not get concerned, right? Not be like, shit, that's not working, but we don't have time. So like full speed ahead, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, having like a better navigation by starting earlier is a huge plus. So if you're not like, no matter who you are, whatever you were thinking, add three weeks to it. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, for, for the most part, the clients that come to me who say, look, I want to do a transformation in 12 weeks for, for the most part, they're happy to kind of move on and, and, and sorry, uh, stay on for another sort of like four to eight weeks just to get things absolutely peeled. Um, yeah. but it's a, it's a common thing. Like, Hey coach, let's, let's get me shredded in three months. It's like, well, well, you know, I've never worked with you before. I don't know how your body yeah. responds to any of this shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, well we'll get you lean, but you yeah. know, contest ready. It might be another thing. Yeah. So yeah, hey, definitely. I've got about 10 or 15 minutes left. So, right. Okay. So let's go on to some of the extra questions. You know what? I wanted to cover this one. Um, what's your advice on picking a coach? Sorry. Now, what's your advice for people on picking a coach? What, what do you want to look for in terms of a, of a good coach? Um, I've worked with a lot of coaches. I've worked with uh, Dave Colombo. I've worked with AJ Sims for a short period of time. Um, I worked with um, Adam Reich, who did a show um, in 2013. I worked with John Arizari. I worked with Chris Tuttle. Um, so I've worked with a, with a lot of coaches and, and honestly, with, with the exception of Colombo, all of them were good. Colombo just didn't respond. He was not, good, <laughs> not a good right. uh, communicator. I don't think he was interested in me cause I was kind of after my injuries and coming back from it and I didn't look like any sort of anything. So I don't think he was, he was like $600, wrote him a check and he was like, cool, here's the diet. Um, but everybody was a little different. Like, uh, I'm giving you a preface before I give you my answer, but basically like John, John was the most friendly guy that I became friends with and, and we still talk and, you know, we, we try to do events and meet up in different cities together. And, um, and I would absolutely hire John again. Um, Tuttle was, was also a friend, um, became a friend after we were client relationship actually. Um, and he was a lot more, um, short with his answers, very busy, um, but, it, but as soon as you would send him a question, he would call you on the phone, yeah. um, which I thought was really good. Um, cause he would, he would talk through it with you instead of just giving you like a one line text. Yeah. Um, and so I've learned from all these people that kind of there's pressure points to when people need contact. And so what I would say is you want to have somebody that's responsive to your needs, but also is not going to bend to your request. Yeah. So that's that's a big thing if you have requests for people like you want to kind of like hey i'd like to structure my life around this event and this and that but i also want to reach my goals if their answer is uh no that's not going to work um be prepared and, and do the diet yeah like that can be the wrong answer right that can definitely be the wrong answer but if you're going to choose somebody um you have to trust them and do the plan yeah right so you have to the number one thing i would say is that you trust their body of work and that you, you trust that if they say something counter to what you believe that you're going to follow it anyway yeah. and you're going to learn from that response. And that's a really hard thing to do. Right. And then if you don't follow it to communicate with them that you, that you didn't follow it. Yeah. So you have to be coachable. First of all, I think that's um, great. I think that's a great choose. word. Coachable. Yeah. You have to be, yeah. but then you have to choose, um, you have to choose somebody that's that you're that you're not going to question their authority basically or their their knowledge you're going to feel comfortable enough to to follow it so like if they're like hey we're uh you know we're going to change the diet we're going to increase the protein decrease the carbs and you're like oh, i really you know i really feel like i train better in the carbs i'm like this is what we're going to do and if you can't do it then i i wouldn't choose them um the other thing thing i guess would be like trusting their analysis um because we don't really see ourselves well yeah um but other people have have a different set of eyes and if if you if you don't trust what they're seeing then 
you just don't hire just don't hire them um i think basically people nowadays i think i think i think we hire people based on a whim a lot of the times you know like you just search their page you get a good feeling from their page or you see a video with them or you see one of their clients or you're you see them at a show with their client like oh he's really paying attention to him you know and it's like whatever that feeling is um you just kind of go with it and that's the whim um and i can't even really say that that's wrong but that's that's kind of how it goes yeah i mean a lot of times you don't have too much more to go on um if you got time for one more question um just the one from ollie which is regarding business goals for the next five years if you just i just wanted to hear your thoughts on that yeah that's a, actually an awesome question yeah i'm always just kind of analyzing i think the next five years thing is kind of hard to, to answer i don't really have that but um i spent the last year and a half um developing a screen print shop mm. hey sorry yeah. yeah my wife went right inside um, wife? yes please oh, thank you thing. sorry about that sorry. um so i spent the last year and a half or so uh, developing the screen print shop and the business for my clothing brand which has been in existence for five years um you know but it's kind of taking on different evolutions so my next year and a half uh we're going to be opening a store the store is going to have multiple facets of use so it'll be uh bodybuilding related health nutrition not a supplement store but more of a whole foods uh it'll have a coffee bar uh, okay, we'll have cool. a lounge area with yeah we'll have a lounge area with video games ping pong table um, <laughs> nice. and then, so there'll be an upstairs open area with a glass partition so you can see us screen printing at the same time wow. so it'll be kind of like a mega store where you come in you can shop for whole foods you can hang out and play some ping pong there's a posing room buy some clothes buy some buy some uh buy a shake bar get a coffee whatever um and then we also print there and uh well you know so people want to have like so we never set out to be screen printers for other people but we do a lot of work for other people mm. um so we're not going to try to get people just to walk into screen print with us, but I'm sure the, as, as a result of having it there, it'll happen that way. Yeah. Um, so that store, that store is the big goal right now to get us going. And I think it's really going to tie it together for me with coaching because I'll have a location where people can come find me, check in uh, posing room, buy the supplements they need, buy the tanning stuff they need. My wife's an esthetician. So we'll probably have hair and makeup there for competitors, mm. posing suits, um, I have a friend who's in the posing suit business, so we're just going to pull it all together, yeah. um, and have a have kind of a mega store. Uh, it's Sounds pretty, amazing. Yeah, yeah, little bit Almenia, and uh, and uh, I'll be uh, I'll be five more minutes. I'm almost done. Okay, they're going to spray for mosquitoes. I'm like standing in the middle of the mosquito. <laughs> <right now. laughs> yeah, so so that that's that's number one right now. That's that's kind of. Uh, been on my list for a while um, and so I guess in five years I see myself with another location maybe where you know just expanding out that business but it's really this has kind of been the pinnacle of things for me for a while is to get that store open um, so I guess I'd say successfully and uh, transitioning I have a family business that my parents are going to be retiring in three or four years. Um, I own 30% of the business and assuming taking over, but I'm not sure if I would just hire uh, people to run it or if I would sell it or if I would just kind of close the doors on it. But the yeah. idea is to be uh, completely on our own. Um, I don't think I want to run the business now at this point. So it's, you know, I still do it now, but I'm, I'm probably transitioning out of that. Yeah. So it'll just be coaching and, and clothing and, the store at that point um i'd really like to be um coaching pro level athletes by that point and having you know being able to travel to all the shows and, yeah. and doing that but it's it's not gonna at some point it was years ago it was very very important to me that i became one of the best coaches um and then i realized that you know maybe i am maybe i'm not maybe, maybe i'm not so much worse than than any of the guys that are at the top now um they just have the, the, the talent or maybe I have a long way to go and the gap is too big and I can't close it, but I don't even know that that's something that you can quantify. I don't know how other than pumping out good material, yeah. you know, pumping out 
the, the winners, there's no way to do it. So I'm focused on my people that I have now and getting, getting the biggest wins that we can. Um, trying to get Chainsaw to win at Nationals yeah. and uh, go from there, you know. Cool. So that's, that's my short answer. Um, you know, kind of my life came to a, uh, like a culmination of some sort, I guess, this year where we moved to this new house and um, financially I'm in pretty good shape. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's not as pressing for me to be a world beater, but I still have those goals there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that sounds great. And you know what? For for any of my guys, if you've not checked out um, Alex's uh, t-shirt designs, and they're really cool. Like he's got some cool original designs. They're fantastic. Um, right, Alex, thank you very much for your time. Um, gonna let you go now, so you don't get bug sprayed. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get bug sprayed. Yeah, that was, that was awesome talking to you. Yeah, cheers, man. All right, speak soon. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye.